And don't fall in love with your solution. Don't fall in love with what you're building. Fall in love with the problem and fall in love with the customer and the customer's needs and be relentlessly focused on delivering that value. So if you need to shift your approach, change your technology, change your processes, do it because ultimately you're looking to deliver the best thing for that end user. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Kimberly West, Director of Product Marketing, your guest host today for today's special series on CX and I'm really excited. We have an amazing guest today. She has a passion for employee experience. She's a constant innovator with a knack for driving change where it matters most. She's been recognized as one of DMZ's 2023 Woman of the Year and one of the Peaks 2023 Emerging Leaders. Transformation Executive, previously with Walmart, Phyllis Morris International, and Deloitte. She's also worked in 12 countries and has a decade of experience in human capital consulting. Welcome to the stage season night. Kimberly, thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be speaking with you today. Yeah, I was looking forward to this session. I think it's gonna be great. And so why don't we start with the question that's always out there. People are interested, what's happening in the customer experience space. They have their own perceptions of what's the right thing to do. What would you say is one of the myths around customer experience that you would want to debunk? I think that there is a myth around surveys and questioning being enough. I truly Mm -hmm. believe that walking the front line and getting as close to customers as possible and actually experiencing what they're experiencing live is the best way to get that information and understand that perspective. That's interesting because I think, uh, yes, a lot of people go the survey route. I think the reason why is it's just hard. It's hard to get in front of customers. Any sort of tips, guidance on like, how do they do that? How do they do it at scale? Well, I think it depends on the industry and how easy it is to get close. But I think about my space, retail and consumer goods, and just walking the front lines and speaking also Mm -hmm. with frontline employees is such a good way to get those real perspectives, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And also to be a customer of the products that you sell or serve in the tech space, any of those areas, actually use your own product as a customer would and feel those pain points firsthand where they exist, as well as celebrate the successes and where you have a really seamless experience, bring that information back into the core. I love that. Yes. I think that's the the key piece. I, it can feel like this big block, but then as you start to look at it, you're like, wait a minute, I, I'm also a customer. I could be experiencing what this looks like. I, I know that I saw on uh, a LinkedIn post once uh, a CEO saying that he went through the call center experience just to see what it was like and realized there was some red flags. So I love that. And you're right. It, surveys aren't enough. So Susan, as I mentioned, very excited for you to be here. You have an amazing background. I want to get into a bit about you and your career and mindset as it comes to the idea of transformation. You've been leading that across a number of different companies I mentioned at the top. What inspired you to pursue a a career in business transformation? Well, I'll say I actually came into it without meaning to. It almost just happened. So I started my career in industrial organizational psychology. I went to school in that space, did a master's. I worked in boutique consulting in talent, talent strategy, and I moved into a client site, Ontario government, and worked there for four years where I was on the inside doing HR policy. I stayed within government and lucked into economic development. And I would say, Both of the roles that I had there really early in my career were transformational, but in completely different ways. In the first one, developing HR policy, I worked with brilliant leaders who took this innovative stakeholder engagement approach to push the needle and take the art of the possible around employee experience and build it into implementable policy. In economic development, my portfolio was around modernizing services to business. 
And that, again, was about building new ways of thinking about a province and a, and a government, not as a monopoly, but as a competitive engine where a business could choose to settle anywhere. And it was about taking a transformational mindset to what had maybe been considered a bit of a an easy win, that, that it's government, so they have that monopoly on the physical space, but a business could settle anywhere. And so I think that got me into the space of thinking very differently, as well as taking on completely different realms of work. I yeah. did an MBA in finance and strategy. I moved into business consulting, and that was where I got to really play across, as, as you mentioned, many countries, many industries, and push the needle around what BAU looks like and what the best of the best looks like and how we can get somewhere in the middle and push and strive for that that new big thing in area. I I love that. I think there's so much in that. And it makes sense then that you were drawn to transformation. If you're exposed to so many different ways of how do you approach a problem, who do you need to partner with to execute on that problem? And then on top of that, factoring in the human factor of change management, how do you actually guide, encourage, get people there? It makes sense, the the path that you've taken in terms of like, how can we apply this now in the business sector, in corporate Canada, corporate America, and what does transformation look like? Especially for us, from our context, we look at it through the lens of technology and how that's transforming things. Well, I always talk about people, process technology, you down path have the people process part and then I'm sure technology has a factored in. I'm curious in the examples that you gave because yeah, there's just so varied. Can you share a project or an achievement that you're particularly proud of in your career? Sure. So I'm going to go into my consulting days and think about an interesting travel initiative I had. I spent eight months in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where I was hired to envision what the talent supply and demand strategy would be for building an entire new industry for the country. And this was transformational because it was a move from old industry and ways of thinking and working into an innovative new space in the energy sector within the kingdom. And I take this example because I'd never worked in that region before. I had not worked in the energy space, but I do think as you become comfortable with transformation and change management and that that view where chaos is to some extent the the status quo, there's going to be complexity and it's how you manage it and how you're able to anticipate what some of the challenges will be and mitigate as much as possible, but also be ready to react in the moment, knowing what that realm of solutions could be that, that I was able to apply in that space. So it was a very interesting, exciting initiative that created large scale economic change within a region. That is phenomenal. And I can imagine the different stakeholders that were involved in such a project. And the I, I think sometimes there's the sense when it comes to transformation and it sounds um, like this fantastical thing, there's some like root work that needs to be done at the people level. And how do you sort of bring them along? I'm curious whether it's that experience or maybe it's another experience that um, you've had. How do you factor in the people side? How do you factor in, there's all these different people. If you're making this change, you're then disrupting how they work. You're yeah. thinking through what is the new way that we should actually be presented. How do you factor that in to bring them along to get them to the point where they actually want to deliver on this new thing where the company or the organization is going? What are the considerations? So there are a lot. I'll, I'll give two models that I look at. And I think they apply both to stakeholders and collaborators outside of your core project team, as well as those people inside who are part of your nucleus actually delivering the work. One of them is around resistance, constructive versus destructive resistance. It's actually a point of benefit for people to speak up and share any of their concerns, red flags, and to be able to anticipate what issues you're going to face rather than just saying, yes, 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 all good. Because there is danger in that relentless positivity 
rather than mm-hmm. taking some kind of realistic perspective. You don't want to be surprised by issues that could have been considered. So I try uh, on these transformation initiatives to decode what the nature of that resistance is and often actually engage in discussion to go deeper to say thank you for sharing now is it to help make us better and and this isn't something i would explicitly say but is it to actually make us better together holistically as a group or is this coming from another place of concern and this goes into that second framework where is that concern from coming from so one place it could be coming from is lack of willingness or ability And that is the part of how you can bring people along on a journey to say, they might have willingness, they might want the change to happen, but they don't know how to do it. And that can be ability. Or it could be that they want to do it, but they're not resourced to do it. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. something that you're trying to add on top of their day job. Maybe this is something that they actually are not willing to do, even if they are able. They think it's the wrong move, the wrong decision. So I look at those pieces and say, what do we need to do to create willingness and ability to bring people along on this journey? And when they are resisting, where is it coming from? And how can I support either making the project different or better or help the person build that that capability or heart and mind commitment to creating the change? I love that. And I, I think that's a framework that works in so many different scenarios. Uh, I'm a mother of two, and I think about willingness and ability. And a lot of times I know intuitively they have the ability, but the willingness is not there. And so to then bring that into frame when it comes to the corporate side, how things work, you're right. There is that sense of if there's going to be change, how do we now factor in, how do we even have sort of the incentives that are going to get to the point of willingness. And if they're not willing, then what does that mean? How do we factor that in? And then if there's the ability, or sorry, if there's not the ability, how do we then cater to that? How do we ensure that they're there? That's the employee side of things. I'm curious then when it comes to transformation, I imagine that's driven by broader goals. One of them probably being, how is this going to impact the end user or the customer? Can you speak to how you sort of look at that and and what that means? So I look to get as close to that customer as possible to start with a transformation that's going to solve a meaningful problem for the customer or give them some kind of meaningful benefit or opportunity out of the work that we're doing. So it's not something that would be envisioned and implemented in a vacuum. There would have to be some kind of touch point or collaboration or, or likely a series of that to make sure that we're on the right track and, and investing our time and resources in the right type of transformation that will maximize value. Then over the initiative, building in as many touch points as possible in reviews, both with the customer and the employees who are closest to the customer will help us get to the best outcome. So I think about how you can build in a cadence of reviews and see if you're on track and don't fall in love with your solution. Don't fall in love with what you're building. Fall in love with the problem and fall in love with the customer and the customer's needs and be relentlessly focused on delivering that value. So if you need to shift your approach, change your technology, change your processes, do it because ultimately you're looking to deliver the best thing for that end user, not to deliver what you originally thought you were going to create. I love that. Don't fall in love with your solution. And that can be sort of the the catchphrase uh, for many people. I think a lot of times you go in with the idea of this is what needs to happen. But to your point, it's really saying, let's actually step back a moment. Let's really understand what's happening at the employee level, the stakeholders that we have involved. This is why it has to be beyond surveys. We actually need to be in the ground, front line, seeing what's happening. I'm curious, you said you have a background on the retail side, CPG. Um, There's been the shakeup. And I think now it's almost normalized this idea of that you have to have the seamless experience online and in person. And especially on the CPG side, it was always indirect. You were sort of relying on the big box store. You weren't creating that personal relationship. I'm wondering, in terms of the transformation there and what you've witnessed, what you've come across, How do companies or even recommendations you have 
on how can they sort of balance providing a really great experience both online and in person if that's what they're looking to change and, and they want it to be seamless? So it, it's a great question. And I'll, I'll say as you're getting at with this, not every retailer is going to want to provide that omni-channel experience. And so in, in the past, when I worked at a large retailer that was an omni-retailer, it was absolutely a point of consideration of how we can make the most seamless experience regardless of channel and make sure that customers could shop where and how they wanted to shop. It was actually the same in my CPG career where we did provide an omni-channel experience and thought about how we could best integrate those channels. And integrating those channels could be structural where you say, we are going to have a group that is in charge of delivering to customers and be that base of customers, regardless of whether it's online or in person. It could be through aligned. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. It could be around aligned metrics to say, we are looking at revenue, customer experience, our whole cost base, and we're not going to differentiate exclusively between channel. We're going to have targets across all channels. And regardless of whether you are an e-com leader or a brick and mortar store leader, you are looking big picture at how you can maximize value. So I'll give you an example of that. Let's say that an employee is in the store walking the hall and a customer walks up and says, so I'm looking for this red patio set and they show it on the website or show a picture of a, a red patio set. The employee says, oh, thank you for coming, but we only have blue in the store. Now, if the employee is incentivized to sell only in store, they'll either push the blue set that the customer doesn't want, or they'll say, sorry, I can't help you and walk away. If they have incentives and metrics that are tied to generic revenue, regardless of the source, they'll say, let me help you buy that patio set online. Let me show you how to use our website and find that Mm -hmm. set and process your transaction. And I think that that's very powerful to say, the closer your metrics can align to the needs of the customer and the needs of the business, rather than an exclusive siloed functional perspective, the better for business. So that's the omni-channel side. I love your response because, and I think you saw the light bulb moment where it's like, yeah, why wouldn't you have a leader that's responsible for both? And so it comes back to what's happening in your organization, that transformation that you want to take on are you already putting in silos or are you putting in the inaccurate incentives that are leading to this broken system? And then it made me think of two experiences I had recently. So I had one experience where I went to a home goods retailer and they didn't have the product in stock, went to the uh, customer service rep and they said, yeah, you know what? We And they seemed like they were ready to be helpful. They're like, yeah, let me check online. It wasn't online, but they were able to see that another location had the quantity. And they said, you know what? We can actually ship it to the store and then you can pick it up here. And I was like, oh, that's great. I would say roughly maybe five or eight minutes it took them to sort of navigate the laptop, figure out everything. And then finally they got to the point where they're like, oh, no, I can't do it. (laughs) I was like, oh, what happened? And they're like, well, because it's not available online in our main inventory stock and it's only available at another store, we don't really have a mechanism to do it in the computer. Although we constantly throughout the day have trucks going between the stores, we haven't actually done that sort of process. So if you want this thing, you have to go to the store half an hour away. And I thought, oh, well, that would have been nice to know before going through this journey. But then I think about another retailer, this one that was now a women's um, leisure uh, retailer. And for them, they immediately, like the actual sales rep walks around with an iPad in her hand. And if it's not in store, she's like, okay, do you want it delivered to your house or do you want it delivered here? And immediate, like there wasn't, it was seconds and it was fine. So you're right to that point of, it really comes down to how have you structured the business? And I like the idea of you saying putting someone in charge of customer because then you're forced to really go through the experience and really think through what's happening. Or And and I like that you mentioned that it's not a single solution. Like the other alternative is what are the incentives? So you could have a head of e-com, you could have a separate head for contact center, but are they being measured in a similar fashion that ladders up to your key goals? 
That's it. it. That's exactly it. And within initiatives, how do you create cross-functional teams that are cross-pollinating, sharing knowledge, and obsessed Mm -hmm. with a customer issue? So let's say that you are thinking about, I don't know, shipping speed, right? You can have so many different areas involved. It's not just your supply chain team. It's not just your transportation team. You can have store operations. You have customer team. You can have process redesign. You can have the merchants involved and how quickly we can stock up and get items in from the vendors. But like having the right people working together from across functions with equivalent passion, educating each other and making decisions in real time rather than having one function lead the process and then them having to ask for permission or ask for for decisions from all of the others. It's just a better way to function when they're all in the room together with equal skin in the game. I agree. And it's interesting. I think what's happening is this idea of how do these different teams better communicate with each other? There there was these boxes, people like the term silos for so long. And now it's the idea of, wait a minute, we all need access to this information in different ways. Um, I was on an interesting call where someone is using the data that comes from the customer. So any sort of contact center call, any touch point with the customer, email, et cetera, but they're funneling that direct to the developer. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, okay, now in any improvement that we're gonna make to our tools, we wanna make sure that we're flagging anything so that you can improve it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I haven't come across a company that's done that, but to the point of they're trying to break down silence. They're like, no, customer analytics, voice of the customer isn't just for marketing. (laughs) We need it to better improve our product development. I love that. And so you can funnel in the feedback. You can also actually co-locate or combine what would be development of new programs, ideas, innovations with the people actually operating in that current state so that those groups are in constant contact. So think about returns desk. What if the people who are designing the future of returns are co-located or working so closely with the contact center processing phone returns or yeah. you know spending time at the physical returns desk understanding those issues. So you have that collaboration of saying, we're developing and then we're testing in real time and we're cross-pollinating between the issues, the opportunities, what works, what doesn't, what the feedback is from the employees closest to the customer, implementing those solutions as well as the customers as recipients or you know the real participants in that process. You so see, you could do it for returns, you could do it for any customer service initiative. And it's the same thing even looking at the product mix that you have. Having the merchants operate so closely to the customers who are purchasing the items and testing and holding focus groups and saying, here's the assortment that I'm looking at putting forward, you know, next spring. What are your immediate views before I actually buy all this stuff? Like you can just get such a a good sense from the real life people who are either going to benefit or step away and say that this isn't for them before you commit too deep. That's true. Now, I, I think the the interesting thing in this conversation and talking through this is, and we kind of touched on it earlier, is the concern about cost of like, yes. okay, if we are going to do this, we're going to relocate people or we're going to um, do more s- sort of conversation with customers one-on-one, that kind of part. And then also just the difficulty piece of like, what does this look like and the people part? So, potentially that's where technology comes in and helps. Any examples that you can share in terms of technology that helps to support the idea of better cross-communication, getting these insights, like thoughts there? So within an organization, there are a lot of collaboration tools that can be used. There are the, the typical Zoom and Teams and having an open chat. There's Slack for similar purpose. But then what I use with my teams in the agility sense, and, and I'm not advocating just for these tools. There's so many others that could be considered. But I use Confluence to give an open page that can have the objectives and the big picture activities that the team is working on. And then Jira, that can be used to get into the nitty gritty of 
tickets or tasks and where they're progressing from backlog that's almost like a to-do list, active that people are working on right now, um, items that we have blocked that either I as a leader or a collaborator leader, depending on the item needs to solve, and then items that we have completed and can celebrate the success of, right? So those can be wonderful for cross-functional teams, whether they're co-located or distributed in different cities, countries, et cetera. Those are really good ways to visualize. But I'll even say in my past life, when I was at Philip Morris and I was leading the HR centers of excellence, as well as organization transformation, I changed a lot about how we did talent acquisition. And one of those changes was to create a Kanban board with post-it notes on the wall inside my office. These do not have to be high-tech solutions. So there is all the technology. There's Reich, Asana, so many options. But it's really about visualizing the work and democratizing access so that Mm -hmm. the delivery team can see it. And in that Philip Morris example, think for talent acquisition, you have all of the roles that you're recruiting for color-coded by function. You have each of the recruiters' names along the left so they can see their own swim lane. And then across the top, you have all of the stages of recruiting from sourcing and identifying candidates, screening the candidates, having a manager interview the candidates, et cetera, right? And all of those tickets can move across your visualization as they progress. So if you are the head of sales, you can just walk over and see all the blue post-its and say, those are my roles and here they are. And, oh, this one role has been sitting for a really long time in manager screening. Maybe I need to go nudge that person on my team and say, why haven't you done the interview, right? It's a really good way to see. And even just managing the flow of work to say, we have a lot of open roles right now. We do not have capacity to deal with all of this. It's, It's a really good way to, at one glance, anticipate where you're going to have capacity issues or capacity opportunities. No, I, I love that. You 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 lost me with Confluence and Jira because as much as I'm a product marketer and I work with product teams and that's their favorite tool, I, I'm the first to be like, no, I do not want to be <laughs> in that tool. But then you got me back when you when you yeah. said Asana and, and, and Kaiban boards because yes, and it's really like you said, whatever your personal preference is, but I think at the core of it and, and what's important is the idea of how do you ensure that you're providing some sort of mechanism, not only for your team, but for other teams to have access? And I love the word that you use about democratize. And I think that's now something that's becoming more and more important. It's democratization of information, of the data that's available, and not assuming that it's only for one team. And yeah. really thinking through how can they access it in their own unique way as well. I'm curious, uh, we talked about the idea of, you know what, outside of surveys, you should be speaking to customers. But I did ask that question about like, then how do you do that at scale? And one of the ways that I would say is potentially technology of like, there's some sort of analytics tool, there's some sort of um, central data lake that you're putting this information, pulling it out. Have you worked with tools like that? Has that supported you? What's the impact you've seen there? Yes, there there absolutely is. And I also don't want to say that there is not a purpose for survey because there's such a helpful way of collecting information. So all I meant is let's not exclusively use surveys. Let's also get out into the front line. Now, other ways you can use data to predict what assortment you need to have. So look at searches. So let's say that you are a retailer and you are trying to decide what type of bread you should be offering. You can look at what customers are searching for and see what the matchup is with what is in your assortment today, but also look at what they're searching for that you're not selling today and see if you have enough customers looking for that product to actually justify bringing it in to your list of offerings. So that's one example of how you can use predictive analytics to say, these are the things that will sell for us in the future. You can also look at loyalty trends. You can see your repeat business. You could look at basket size, how much are customers buying at any given time? What types of products are they buying? What products are they buying together? So there might actually be surprises in what is involved in a typical shopping trip. 
Do they buy toothpaste when they buy their food? Or do they buy toothpaste in a separate shop with their various toiletries and maybe bed goods? Maybe they're buying all of their bedroom, bathroom items together. I don't know. It, it depends. But I, it, there's information out there that will help people better understand the purchasing patterns and needs of their customers. And even looking at what sizes or what colors go out of stock first, in store, online, by geography, all of that is valuable information that can help understand the profiles of customers and and understand the customer journey in a much more nuanced way. That's intriguing. And when you went through that list, I what sort of struck me is that you also kind of have to know the questions. So a lot of times it's not even the answer as much as what are the right questions to be asking so you can really tap into that data and research and what's happening. Um, it leads me to then think about AI. So artificial intelligence, especially generative AI with open AI coming on the scene has become this big thing. And of course, with your background in transformation, I can imagine this is one of the things that are top of mind for a lot of people. I I'm curious uh, from your standpoint, you know, examples where you feel maybe it could further enhance what's happening, whether it's in the retail space or other spaces that um, you've worked in? So I'll give you a, a story. I remember sitting in a management meeting and our head of innovation at the time told us about this thing called chat GPT and none of us had heard of it before. And it was a conversation where he was trying to explain what it does and how it can be used and was saying, this is going to revolutionize how we work, how we live. And so we pulled it up. And I remember at the time typing in, build me a change management plan for an agile transformation. And mm -hmm. instantaneously, it made me a plan. And I thought to myself, this is going to cut down a lot of the work that my team as a transformation engine was delivering. But I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't nervous about it. I thought, there is so much opportunity to start with a foundation that could actually be created through generative AI and taking, you know, millions of plans that have been created in the change space, the communication space, understanding, you know, what the top 10 processes are that could be automated, getting at that foundational information, and then thinking to the next level of how we can spend more time with our customers or stakeholders to implement that plan. So let's say it's that that change management plan for agile transformation. Once we have that framework and maybe we create a list, chat GPT, what are the 10 biggest risks that you might face in an agile transformation? Love Going it. out and working with those partners to like make, to educate them to refine that list, see what is actually most relevant in this unique context, and then work with them hand in hand as trusted advisors to mitigate those risks and deliver a new way of thinking and working. S some things humans still need to do, but let's not be worried about the things that machines can help us do by building that foundation or taking away some of the manual behind the scenes work that my team would always have done, but would be you know, preferring to actually get out there and walk the halls and walk the floors of a store and, and spend time closer to the people, whether on the employee side or customer side or our collaborative partner side. I love that. And I, I feel the same way. I feel it, it's opportunity. And so now it's the question of what is the opportunity? It actually gives you that time to think through what are the other things we could be doing now that I don't have to do the grunt work of going through every piece of data, connecting the dots myself, and then trying to see what type of insights I can pull from it. If that's done for you, then what is the opportunity to think through some other initiatives that could be executed? Maybe deeper dive on the conversations you could be having with customers or employees. Uh, so I find, I love the story of like, no one really knew what it was because it did come out. I feel like it came out and then as it came out slowly, or even just this year, then there's conversation about the fact of like, it's always been here, guys. Why do you not know this? And it's like, no, no, last year was definitely a pivotal moment. But even outside of generative AI, AI itself has been here for a very long time. Any examples of where potentially you've done that or maybe helped the client sort of adopt AI and, and improve the process? Well, I'll actually give you a better example than one of mine. So I am a 
really excited by some of the automation and robotics that Chipotle is doing. And I read about how Chipotle is using cobots, collaborative robots, and processes that combine human elements with machine robotics to deliver activities within their restaurants. And one that uses AI and is a cobot is the chip making machine. And so in this machine, <laughs> it, yeah, they identified that humans do not want every chip to be perfect because that perfect chip, it, it's very standard. Your taste buds get used to a certain flavor, shape. They like that kind of human taste to this chip of how, how it can be unique, how it can have a curl, how it can have more salt or less salt on any one piece. So they actually use our AI to mirror how humans make chips and those unique distinctions in chip to chip, those unique pieces. So I, I thought that was very interesting. They also had the guacamole making machine that's, that's quite similar, that is uh, something that will get rid of a lot of the manual tasks of humans, but that require humans to feed the avocados into the machine. Uh, I don't know. There's really exciting work coming out of that organization, and I've been very interested in following their transition. I, I love that because, yes, if you are the chip connoisseur and you're like, I need the right chips, the right assortment of <laughs> chips, that, that's perfect. And I, I think what it does, what I also love about that example, is it shows you the sort of advancement that we've come. So AI is on the scene, but this idea of technology and human working together, I love their term of cobot or collaborative bot, has always been there. What AI is now allowing to happen is additional personalization. So the automation piece was there for a very long time. I, I like watching sort of how does this work or how do you do it kind of shows on YouTube and TV. And they show how people are working along a machine to create boxes or furniture, all these different things, but it was all automation. It wasn't the AI piece. And then when AI comes into it, with your example, it's the idea of, wait a minute, how can we now connect the dots of a lot of different data points and turn that into a service or a product that's going to better serve the audience? And I, I love that because to me, that's Chipotle going beyond and above listening to their customers. They didn't just say, okay, we have this data, let's sit it on the shelf and we'll tackle it later. This is the perfect example of how AI allows you to imagine new possibilities. But wait a minute, it might have been expensive to think through this, but now we can just install it in store. We don't need to have a third party manufacturer putting chips together. Amazing. It <laughs> is. And I'll give one more example that I saw recently. So I came across this app and it gives you the opportunity to photograph every item in your closet and identify what the occasion is. And then it puts together outfits for you. And now the AI part is that it learns based on your feedback, as well as the feedback of others going through similar processes of outfit matching, how to create more perfect outfits. So <laughs> it, it takes the feedback and continues to evolve. But interesting use of AI to understand what is appropriate for an occasion and where, and then tailor it to your own closet. I, I love that because... Again, just the idea of like, wait a minute, I can have this on my own. I don't need to hire some high fashion <laughs> personal assistant designer person that I probably wouldn't have hired anyways. And then I can feel confident, show up the way that I need to. There, there's so many knock-on benefits and I think it's super cool. We are getting close to the end of the show. And when we get close to the end, we like to do sort of quick take questions just to kind of round things out. And so don't feel like you have to go into too much detail, but again, it's kind of getting to, to know you as we round out the show here. And it's been fantastic. So really uh, have appreciated your perspective on what should we be thinking about as we approach this idea of transformation, adopting technology, getting people to come along with us as we try to change. Uh, so curious, in your role, in your experience, what are the things that typically keep you up at night? Like if you think about projects, what are maybe some pieces of it, maybe some common themes where you're like, oh yeah, this usually is a point of stress that I have to kind of work through for us to get to the next real place. So there's typically a point of a major transformation coming up to launch 
where people start getting worried about what the future post-launch is going to be and what getting through that launch is going to mean for them, their careers, their workload, what they're going to be spending their time on. And you start to see a drop off in productivity as well as an increase of stress. I know that that happens. I know when it's coming. And that's something that I very much try to build stability and an understanding of that future state to avoid the slowdown and the stress. I love that. And again, a testament to the, just the different experiences that you've had. I'm curious, what's one thing you wish you had known when you started your career? I wish that I understood there's a lot, you know, I, I think in my career, I was someone who was relentlessly curious, followed opportunities, and have always been attracted by learning, collaboration, working with brilliant people. I wish that I knew that art of the possible and what the future would hold and that mm -hmm. these technologies would be coming out that would be creating this massive change or that there are niches and areas to pursue that that at, at the time I didn't even know existed. I know I'm, I'm saying right now, I wish I could uh, predict the future. <laughs> I do recognize that. But, <laughs> you know, I think it, it's more like understanding the pace of environmental and organizational change earlier on would have been an easy way to anticipate where my career would have gone because it's changed so much as transformations have changed my career and I have adapted at that rapid pace as well. No, I, I love that. Um, so then I'm curious, because you mentioned you worked in Saudi Arabia. I mentioned at the top that you've actually worked in 12 different countries. Uh, I'm curious then, where would you want to spend more time either working, exploring, or even just taking a vacation? Oh, so this is going to sound funny. I've never been to Italy. And the thing is that anytime I've done a trip to Europe, I've almost defaulted to France. And it's because when I find something I love, I'm, I'm a changer, I'm a transformer. But in my personal life, I'm more of a creature of habit. So I would love to spend more time in Italy. I have this this vision of, you know, having buffalo mozzarella and tomatoes and just sitting in some lovely cafe. I don't know. It, that that's where I would love to go for a vacation in the future. And then for work, oh, I'm so open. I have loved everywhere that I've, I've worked in the world. Maybe going back to Singapore, that, that would be a, a dream place to be located for a, a phase of my career whenever that happened. No, I, I love that. Um, so I'm probably the flip where I've never been to Singapore. So that would be a cool place to explore and, and potentially vacation. I've been to Italy. I went to Venice. I went to Rome. Um, I went to Milan. And yes, all the things that you just said, definitely possible and amazing. I actually prefer Italy. Everybody's always like Paris okay. and you have to visit Paris. I also went to Paris but the, I fell in love with Rome. And so if you're going to go, include Rome as part of the trip, and I think you'll have a really great time. So in closing, um, and it's been a great episode on the idea of how do we embrace this idea of creating really great experiences and the idea of the transformation that's required. And that transformation really takes into account the people side of things and what processes can you put in place what are the ways that you can think through? My takeaway from you is the idea of, are they willing and are they able? And how do we then balance and tackle that? The idea that technology is there to actually really be your cobot, similar to Chipotle, yeah. where it's really there to collaborate with you, not to replace you. And it opens up such great possibilities. So again, Susan, thank you so much for your time. Really great. I'm sure this is going to help a lot who are now embracing this idea of AI transformation and trying to figure out where do I start? Thank you. Well, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.